Well, happy Saturday, everybody. Glad you can join us here at Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and Matt Allen is out on location, will be joining us. We're here to help you with your car every Saturday from 11 to noon, right here on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. We're putting you in the know when it comes to car stuff. If you've got car questions, we've got car answers, and we encourage you to give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today we're going to be talking about a little bit of fuel injection, which gas is right for my car. We're going to be taking your calls, and as I said, Matt is out on location at the Good Guys Car Show, and he's going to be joining us in a minute. And we've got the guys from Automotive Diagnostic Specialties. They're out of South Tempe or Chandler. Either one of them, if you're in that area, great shop from Bumper to Bumper Radio. They're also known as ADS. So we've got Greg LaFonsi, the owner, and Mason, his main man. So it's real good to have you guys with us. How's it going this morning, Greg? Good. Good morning. And Mason? Good. Real good. Good morning. They look a little shy in front of the microphone, but we'll get them going as the day goes on. There's nothing they can't handle if you've got questions. So anyway, uh, like I said, we've got Matt on location. How's it going, Matt? Are you really there or uh, where are you at? Dave, I am here out at Westworld at the Good Guys Rod and Custom Association Hot Rod Show out here. And I've got to apologize, but it gets a little noisy. We've got some uh, some cars rolling through the autocross out here, and, and uh, it's getting a little bit loud. But I'm with John Drummond, and uh, there's some really cool stuff happening out here. John, how are you doing today? Doing great, man. It's a great day out here. It started a little bit chilly this morning, but things are warming up, and the event's getting back on track out here this weekend at Westworld. And, uh, yeah, like you are saying, it's a little noisy because behind us is the uh, Good Guys Autocross, a bunch of muscle cars racing around cones to see who can go fastest. So, John, the guys that, and the gals and families that haven't heard about this before, what is the Good Guys Sports Spring Nationals? What's this all about? Well, this is one of the Valley's largest automotive events. Uh, we've got uh, about 2,000 classic hot rods, customs, and muscle cars out here this weekend, all displaying. Um, not too many of them for sale. There are for some, uh, some of them for sale, but this is mostly all show. And, uh, you know, you can bring the family out here, check out all these beautiful cars. We've got the big tent, the big brown tents full of exhibitors. We've got a big, big trucks on the midway that are selling parts and offering stuff for shopping. We've got free activities for the kids we've we've got uh, face painting for the kids and balloon animals and all kinds of cool stuff so it's it's a family festival built around classic cars yeah that you know that's the one cool thing i like all these cars you think it's just a bunch of guys out here but no it's families and kids stuff and, and that's the other thing that makes it really really neat it's a, it's a good family event and there's just so many cars out here there's stuff that maybe your parents drove when you were young and and boys but it's not your father's old mobile anymore it's a really tricked out car so that, that's what's really one of the things I really like about it. You know, and then there's something called the All American Sunday, where people can bring bring a car even tomorrow if, if you want to get it out of the garage and dust it out and, and bring it out here and be part of the show. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, the Good Guys All American Sunday. As long as it's American powered and uh, American made, it can come out here regardless of the year. So if you've got like a 2012 Camaro, uh, you know, sitting in your garage, bring it on out for uh, for thirty dollars. You can join the show and show your car right along some of these uh, right alongside some of these classics. Because as you know, I mean, Detroit is now making a lot of newer versions of the old famous muscle cars like the Camaro, the Dodge Challenger. Uh, you know, the Pontiac came out with the GTO a few years ago. So there's a lot of brand-new muscle cars that are being made by the factory in Detroit, and uh, we welcome them out to our shows on Sunday. Yeah, I tell you, it's, it's really neat. I come out here and came out here last November for the first time, and, and being a car guy, I'm surprised I had never been out here. And it's just absolutely amazing, just the cars, the colors, the paint. I mean, you just shake your head and wonder well, how did they make these cars so beautiful it's, it's really neat so uh, anything else we're missing i mean the, the, the traffic was easy getting that out of here you can see i mean i was driving down the 51 there's the hot rods are out they're out for sure 
Yeah, well, the nice thing about it is, uh, you know, tomorrow the forecasters are being generous with a high temperature of about 70 degrees. So there's going to be bright sunshine and lots of colorful hot rods out here on Sunday, March 10th. And like we just talked about, it's the All-American Sunday. So we'll have all the classic cars as well as all the later model cars out here. The autocross will be going on. So if you really want to come out and see this event under the sunshine tomorrow, March 10th, Sunday is the day for that for sure. Well. Yeah, and today's the day to beat the crowd. That's you know, don't forget we're we're here all day today too. So, well, That's... John, it's been it's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. It's great. I'm glad we're out here again. And uh, <laughs> just glad I didn't bring my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> we're glad to have you guys, man. We'll look forward to maybe we can get you on the autocross course in November. Oh yeah, we'll get a heads up challenge. Dave and I will duke it out. And... About to come up with something. Yeah, I think I think I want to put my my Honda Element up against uh, Matt's Toyota <laughs> Toyota Tundra. <laughs> no, 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 Dave. American car, American horse car, baby. I'm just gonna take the, the emblem off the front and put a Chevy on, and maybe they won't notice. <laughs> yeah, I got some cross-eyed looks in my uh, Toyota truck today, but uh, it's all good. So it's uh, it's fun. It's fun out here. So. Well, hey, th- thanks again, John, for being with us. Hey, anytime. Pleasure talking to you. Well, uh, Automotive Diagnostics, the name Diagnostic is is uh, a big part of your name. How did you guys get your start, and why did you pick Diagnostics as your name? Uh, when I started out, I was a drivability tech, and um, when we got the business going, I just chose the diagnostic end of it, and um, it led into everything, full repair, performance. What year did you start at this? 95. 95. So you started out with the, the niche of just doing diagnostic. Well, I started out as a tech in the early 80s doing diagnostics. Well, diagnostic has totally changed from back there in that day. What is the number one change you you would say? Sophistication of the computers, um, all the diagnostic equipment and scan tools, electronics that you have to have to work on them now. Well, and that's the one point is that diagnostic, it's, it's literally a software game. I mean, how many how many scanners do you have, and how many cars can you talk to? I mean, that's a that's a big part of it. And uh, you know, some people think of the auto parts store, and you can go in there, and they'll plug into your car, and they'll give you a few pieces of information. That's only maybe one tenth of what's really out there, if if even that. Agreed. Correct. It might lead them to the right uh, the right uh, circuit um, where the problem starts, but there's a lot of diagnostics that has to go to actually pinpoint. Where the, where the problem is in that circuit. And we've talked about this here on shows recently, and uh, Mason's over there. He's kind of quiet, but uh, we recently had a car that we got in our shop, a Ford Thunderbird, and the guy had been to uh, the dealership two times uh, to get this thing running right. And then when he gave up on that, he actually went to another independent auto repair facility, and that guy told him it was a transmission problem. So that's how it ended up at my shop. From my shop, we road tested it, and well, we did feel a transmission problem. Uh, shop number two was right on that. They were wrong. It still had an engine misfire. So I called the customer and I said, "Hey, we we know we've got a little bit of a transmission problem. It's not a major one, but we really, in order to diagnose the transmission, we need to get the engine running right." So I took it up to the guys at ADS because anytime it's you know, there's easy things to diagnose. And that's great, but there's also hard ones, too. And this one had obviously been to three shops before mine to be at the fourth shop, Automotive Diagnostics. So uh, and you found some bad coils on it. Uh, yeah, actually, after a uh, short test drive, we did notice a misfire on there and brought it back to the shop and uh, did a little bit of diagnostics on there and found a number seven ignition coil was bad. And those uh, that particular one happened to have a updated part number for the coils. There were a known, uh, known problem on there, so... Did uh, coils and spark plugs on there and took care of that end of the problem. Took care of that end of the problem. And there was no code. There was nothing in the computer that said there was a misfire. And when I drove it, the only reason I knew it was a misfire was my seat of the, you know, seat of the pants feel of the car. I've been driving cars. I drive 30 cars every week. So I know what they feel like, how they should be. So I knew we had a misfire, but there was no P0300 code or misfire code. So even if you went to the auto parts store and they plugged into it, they wouldn't see it. But what you saw is that you saw a misfire in the data. There's a misfire counter that you can look at. And you say, man, this thing's misfiring five times. Is that five times a minute? Is that what it's picking up? Um, No, uh, five times on each basically power cycle or every revolution of the engine. Um, Actually, on one of the data streams, we can see what's called a power balance. And you can see on the graph that that cylinder's not contributing uh, during the power cycle. 
So that's a lot more information that you would see just plugging into the scanner here at uh, Acme Auto Parts or whatever. So I, I, I really want to take this this segment to, to explain to people. There is so much that goes into diagnostic, and the, the guy that plugs in at Acme Auto Parts is just barely scratching the surface. And there is depths. Uh, you know, there's guys that can take it further than I can take it, and we take it pretty far. And for us, what we do is we work, we partner up with shops like Automotive Diagnostics, if there's an engine runability issue, these guys have got a dy- you know, dynamometer, which we can talk about later, that they can really test these cars and put them in running situations that I can't duplicate. So anyway, when we come back, we've got Richard and Doug in open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and uh, Matt Allen is out on location at the Good Guys Car Show. If you want to go join him, I've got Greg LaFonsi from Automotive Diagnostic Specialties in Sal Tempe, or Chandler, uh, ADS for short, uh, along with Mason. And we're all here to help you with your car. So up first this segment, we're going to go with Richard in Mesa. looks like on a 2005 Ford Focus. Go ahead, Richard. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call, guys. You bet. Here's my problem. I've got a 2005 Ford Focus automatic transmission, 2 liter. Between 30 and 40,000 miles, I developed uh, a bad vibration while in drive at a stop. Finally, around uh, 39,000 miles, somebody said, change the right front motor mount. That'll take care of it. Well, I did, and it took care of it. The car ran like brand new. About 2,000 miles later, uh, it started to vibrate again, uh, same way. So <clears throat> I replaced the motor mount again. It seemed to help the vibration somewhat, but didn't uh, take care of it totally. Um, it seems as though heat and cold uh, both engine temperature and outside temperature uh, uh, affect the uh, the vibration uh, again. It seems as though when it's uh, uh, the engine warms up or when it's rather warm outside, uh, the uh, the vibration goes away. So okay. I've re- I've replaced the throttle position sensor and the air air flow sensor, not the mass airflow sensor. But the airflow sensor. Okay. So. Well, I think uh, Mason's looking at me like he thinks he knows what's going on with your car. Any thoughts that come right to the top for you, Mason? Uh, probably a couple problems. You got uh, notoriously weak motor mounts on those to begin with. So what you noticed is that they wore out fairly early in a short amount of mileage. The problem with only replacing one of them is the rest of the motor mounts are also weak at the same time. So you're kind of hiding the problem a little bit just by replacing one when most likely you probably need to replace all of them uh the other reason you're noticing it at different temperatures is for one the uh the softness of the rubber if you want to put it that way and the motor mounts can change and also your idle speed depending whether it's uh hot or cold can also vary slightly so maybe more pronounced at different idle speeds Excellent answer. I think uh, that's right on the money. As far as motor mounts go, it sounds like, you know, good motor mounts will mask an engine that's not quite running perfect. You know, so he did a couple things to try may- maybe make the engine run smoother. Um, and then also buying one motor mount at a time. You know, buying one motor, motor mount at a time is-, is not generally a good idea. Let's take a front-wheel drive car. There's typically four motor mounts. There's one underneath the radiator. There's one at the back side by down by your feet or on the firewall so just other side of your feet there's one there there's one on the passenger fender so to say or on the strut tower and then there's one on the driver's side fender so at tri-city transmission what we always do is replace them as a pair so let's say your front one underneath the radiator is broken well all that means is the back one is trashed because it, it hasn't been battling the vibration of the engine as a pair because the motor is going to rock front to back front to back so it's like a rubber band you can only stretch a rubber band out so many times uh, before it's going to s- decide to break and that's what engine mounts do so hey uh, Richard thanks so much for the call and uh, Mason that was a great answer so we're going to go with Doug in Scottsdale on a 2004 Lexus go ahead Doug you're on bumper to bumper radio thanks how are you guys doing today we're doing great Good. 
Hey, I have a, this is my wife's car, and it's got an un, unusual irritating uh, transmission symptom. When you come up to a, let's say, a rolling stop, you, for example, if you exit off the freeway and then you, at the end of the exit, you roll into a right-hand turn, as you slow down to the intersection and begin to accelerate, there's a, a very long hesitation before the transmission kicks in. And it, it seems like it might be getting worse, but I can't tell if it's related to the temperature. I don't know if that's possible. But it's getting to the point where now um, uh, you need to make sure that you've got a big, clear lane of traffic because you never know when it's going to kick in. So I, I don't know what's causing that. How many, how many miles are on that Lexus, Doug? It, you know, it's funny you ask. It's got about 76,000, and I just had the tranny completely flushed uh, by a real good company down in Tempe you probably heard of. And they did the road test, and to kind of go to along with the fact that it's intermittent, they passed the road test. So, it, you know, they obviously didn't notice it, and it doesn't happen all the time. But when it happens, it's very pronounced and very disturbing because it catches you off guard, and before you know it, traffic behind you is just crawling up behind you. Right. Well, what you're describing to me is a coasting downshift. Uh, the transmission that's in that Lexus more than likely is a U240. So you're kind of rolling, you're rolling up to a stop, the light turns green, and you go ahead and get it back. So the transmission's got to re-engage. And if it's intermittent, it is tough on the shop. That's, uh, you guys are looking at me like that's the, the toughest problems we deal with. Uh, if you're nice to those guys down in Tempe and you give them a little bit of time with the vehicle, they'd be happy to put a pressure gauge on it and a scanner on it and... Uh, Take it to lunch, you know, take it for errands, run the car around as much as I can uh, to see if we can catch it in the act and know what to go after. But more than likely, we see a lot of pressure regulator valves We're out in that transmission. Certainly it's 70,000, 80,000 miles on a Toyota transmission. It's got a ton of usable life left in it. Uh, so it's not something where we've got to pitch the whole transmission. There's a very good possibility the valve body can either be repaired or replaced. But it is going to take time at the shop to, uh, you know, for them to find it. Otherwise, we're just, it's just a shot in the dark. We've got to prove in order to diagnose. Mason, you look like you got a thought about that one. No, I'm, I agree with you, too. It, it takes some time sometimes to duplicate the problems on there. So, and, and, and that's, it's not something to be ignored. Uh, we had a caller, I think it was uh, several weeks back, he had a Toyota Highlander. And the only time it would act up would be on a 6% grade when he was driving up to Payson. And uh, and he would the car would would shift down from third gear to second gear and it hit really hard, and but when he drove it it drove great we could not duplicate the situation so he was headed out of town I said can I have the thing for a couple of days I'm gonna literally drive it up, uh, you know to the Saguaro Lake just past the Saguaro Lake exit there's a nice nice hill we went up it and down it and back up it turned around and we kept running the hill with a pressure gauge on it and a scanner it literally took two technicians. But what we called before, and that's really the same transmission as what you have in your Lexus, uh, was a pressure regulator valve. So we were able to pull it out, uh, ream the valve, put a new valve in there, and uh, take care of it. So anyway, when we come back, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. We've got Doug, John, and Liz, and it looks like uh, I can't pronounce that name. We'll be back. you listen to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and I guess Matt is still hanging on the phone with us. How are you doing this morning, I'm, Matt? <laughs> I'm, I'm here, Dave. And, you know, of course, my phone, Hot Rod Lincoln, there's uh, You're probably, the, people that work, well, the people that were with us in the beginning out here at the uh, Good Guys National at Westworld. If you're a hot rod or bar guy or anything, there's some really cool stuff out here, all kinds of stuff going on. It's really, really, it, it's cool to be out here. Lucky me, you're stuck in the studio. I know. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring my Honda Element out there with a GM logo on the front, so I can race you on the autocross. <laughs> we do it up. We've also got Greg LaFonsi from Automotive Diagnostics. You may have heard his commercial playing here just a bit ago. Uh, it was like uh, he's super shy, so we had to drag him in the studio to do his own commercial. But they're a fantastic shop uh, in Chandler. Uh, if you're looking for a good shop, you can find them at BumperToBumperRadio.com. And we've also got Mason in studio, uh, who is one of his lead technicians, and he is uh, helping us help you with your car. So we're going to go to Liz in Goodyear. Uh, looks like on a 2002 Volvo. Go ahead, Liz. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning. How are you? Not too bad. What's going on with your Volvo? You know, I'm my Volvo has been, it's, it's um, as I said, 2002, and it has quite a few miles on it. It's um, 253,000 
54,000 miles on it. But, of course, it's paid off, and I wanted to see um, if it's worth me to put the financial efforts into it to keep it running so that I can or, you know, go ahead and trade it in and get a, another car for that kind of money to repair it. So it has a slight leak. It has an oil leak, and I put some of that leak stop stuff in it, and it seems to slow it down a bit. But I'm wanting to get someone to check over it. I've also been told it's a transmission problem that may be coming up, but they said, you know, just drive until it goes. So anyway, I wanted to get somebody to run a diagnostic on it, see what I'm looking at financially, so I can determine, you know, is it worth putting the money into it with the miles I have on it, because I know they're reliable, or do I just need to come to reality that it's time to let it go? Do you feel any transmission problems when you drive it? Well, I feel like... um, if, if I'm describing it properly, like I can feel like like ridges or something when it goes to shift sometimes, but it seems like that's only in the early stages of shifting. Right, right. Well, it kind of sounds like to me that you need more than just a diagnostic. You you may need the transmission diagnosis. That's just one component. But you're you're thinking about, hey, do I invest in this car going forward? And I kind of have a little rule of thumb because every time you hit a 100,000-mile mark, so at 100,000 miles, you got to invest in the car. At 200,000 miles, you got to invest in the car. And I'm not sure how much investment you did at 200,000 miles, but now we got 250,000 miles. Before you do any major repairs to that thing, the car really, it's kind of like getting on the scale. We may not want to get on it to find out what we really weigh, but we still have to. So not only do you want a diagnostic for the issues you might be having, you really want somebody to look that car over top to bottom and find out everything wrong with it just so you can see what it is. But you don't want to kind of get a half idea and invest you know, a few thousand dollars to have something big coming down the road. Uh, what do you got? Any thoughts, Matt? Yeah, you know, that's why we do, I call it the comprehensive vehicle inspection. You, you know, you're at a decision point for this car very likely. I really don't like people to say just drive it until it, it, you know, it blows up, so to speak, because that yeah, you can very well ruin a perfectly good car like that. So I think the best thing to do is go in, find a shop, bumper to bumper radiocom It's actually doing Canner Motors. is a Volvo, one of our Volvo specialists. And let them go front to tail on that car, look everything over. They know the pattern failures. They know the, they know the issues that you, you're going to potentially have. And, and if you gather all your repair history and service history, they'll comb through all that. Then you can come up with a plan. And that plan may say, no, it's time to time to bail. Let 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 you know. Let's just do some teenagers first cars that they want to drive it for a couple years and, and uh, just struggle along with it. Or they might say, yeah, we're going to need to do this repair of the transmission, and we've got this and that, and then maybe you're good for another thirty thousand miles. And, and hey, that's you know, maybe you have to spend a little bit of money, but it, it's going to cost you three or four hundred dollars a month to drive a new car. So. Make money by driving your old cars. That's why I like both some of that. Well, Greg, what do you think? High mileage car, two hundred fifty thousand miles. What what thoughts are scratching your mind? Well, I'm a big fan of high mileage cars because I own them. <laughs> um, I'm with Matt. If, if the do a complete check over on the vehicle and find out what it really needs right now and make the decision if it's going to be worth putting the money in now or if it is time to release the car. Well, he made, a, he made a good point there about pattern failures. So we see the certain same things happen over and over and over again. Uh, you know, when I see a 2002 Volvo, the first thing that pops into my mind is radiators leaking into the transmission. It's a real common one that there was bulletins about and, and uh, lawsuits. If there wasn't lawsuits, there should have been. But there's pattern failures that we see, and we have a couple of great Volvo specialists at bumper bumperradiocom We've got Tanner Motors, who's uh, off of Coulter, and then we've got in the, in the east, far east valley, we've got Mesa Auto Works. So those are a couple of good sources so you can decide what the right thing to do with your car is. Um, is it time to, you know, I'm going through the same thing with Rob Hunter. He's on the show after us. I've got his, I believe it's a 1998 Honda Accord, and uh, he, he says, I've hardly done anything to it. You know, and it's got 180,000 miles on it, and it's making noise when I put it in reverse, and I, I really don't want to know, but I need to know. And so I said, hey, we're going to find everything wrong with this car, and then we're going to decide how much longer you want to keep it. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, he's going to get another couple of years out of it, and we're just going to pick the minimal things to get him by. But we got to have a full picture before we decide to invest in the vehicle. So thanks so much. 
They do said one thing too. We're going to find everything wrong with the car. Just that we find everything doesn't mean we have to fix everything. That's where the communication and the relationship with the shop is so important. We're going to talk about this. We're going to understand how you're going to use the car, the future, and all that. That really plays a, plays a big role into it. Talking about it, you know, and betting out. For sure. Use it in the future as well. Well, thanks so much for the call, Liz. We're going to go with John in Maricopa, who's been holding ever so patiently. Go ahead, John. You're on Bumper hey to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Hey. I have a 2002 Dodge Intrepid, and not too long ago, I was turning the steering wheel, and I heard a noise, like a spring break, and my uh, airbag light came on. They said there's a coil spring in the steering column. How is that uh, what it is, and how big of a deal is it to change that? Well, it looks like Mason knows your answer. Go ahead, Mason. Uh, the thing in your steering column is actually called a clock spring. Uh, it's a, a ribbon, a cable that's coiled or inside of a housing. Um, you hadn't had any kind of uh, power steering rack replaced or anything like that before that happened? No, he's already, yeah. So I think, yeah, definitely a clock spring. Okay, yeah, it's definitely a clock spring problem. It's uh, As far as replacing it, what has to happen? Uh, basically just... Uh, it's pretty easy. You just pull the steering wheel and the clock spring assembly comes out of there uh, with a cable attached to it um, hooked up to your airbag harness. Now you said easy. That's easy to you because you're a technician. Would that be easier to do it yourself or we got an airbag in there? Is that a do it yourself or project? Uh, no, generally anything to do with the airbag or something like that's not a do it yourself project. So hopefully that helps you out there, John, on your, uh, your O2 Dodge Intrepid. I think it's a fairly common thing when the car's got, you know, 100,000, 125,000 miles on it. But that's, that, that cable or that ribbon has to follow the steering wheel and still keep the connection. So as many times, and what uh, Mason was starting to go to, is that when the rack and pinion gets replaced, sometimes that thing gets a few extra turns than it normally might get. So I think he was going there with that. So anyway, thanks so much for the call. Well, fuel injection, which fuel should I be running in my car? And I've heard some, some uh, personalities say, oh, yeah, you know, 87 octane is all you need to spend money on. And uh, Matt had wrote the most recent blog uh, for uh, Bumper to Bumper Radio that's on KTR. I don't think it's up as of yet. But the point was, as gas prices get up, we're getting up to $4 a gallon some places, and the tendency is one to go ahead and throw the 87 octane in the car to save a few dollars. Uh, and then sometimes on the other end, when it's not so much to save money, some people think they're doing a good thing when, and they're putting in the, you know, the 91, 92 octane in lieu of the 87, and is that doing them any benefit? So right off the bat, what are your initial thoughts? Um, I firmly believe in running what the vehicle was recommended to run on. Um, when you run premium fuel, if that's what the vehicle was designed to run on, you're going to get your best performance and your best fuel economy. If you're going to put in a lower octane fuel to save money, you're not going to. You're, you're going to have save higher wear and tear. You're probably going to have 10 to 20 percent lower performance if the computer starts retarding the timing because it's picking up all the knock. Well, and before the show, I asked you, I said, what do you think? And you said, hey, we've got a, I think it was a late model, 2000, 2008 Cadillac Escalade. And you can literally look on the scanner and you can see that the uh, computer is retarding the timing from its normal place by 10 degrees? It was pulling the, the specified timing by as much as 10 degrees. Just, which, to just to compensate for the bad fuel, in which case he called the consumer and said, uh, you're not running 87 octane by chance, are you? If you can afford the Cadillac, you've got to be able to afford the 92 octane. As much as we want to say, you know, yeah, you can save some money, a few bucks a gallon, there's no benefit to it. And another point in Matt's article, and you can chime in here, Matt, on this if you want, but I've got a, you know, I've got a vehicle that doesn't require me. It doesn't say on the, on the dashboard, it doesn't say premium fuel only. It doesn't say it on the fuel cap, premium fuel only. But uh, there's no sense if you have that type of vehicle. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I, I didn't quite hear all that, Dave. I went over and switched my phone off from the mute <laughs> as I actually pull into the studio parking lot right now. But, um, yeah, I mean, just it's a waste of money to, to use the premium if you don't need it as well because it, it's going to ignite later in the combustion process, and, that, and that's not when the, engine, when the manufacturers and engineers design this stuff. That's not not how they wanted it to burn, so it's going to be have a counter effect on it. It's just it's not worth it. And just like Greg said, and I said in the article, stick with what they said. That should be your best bet for efficiency and, and everything else. Especially like on a turbocharged car or something like that, you can really melt them down. 
Well, long deal. right now, the the other thing that happens is, uh, you know, in the old days, we were used to buying additives, cleaners, uh, f- you know, for fuel injection or whatever it may be, or an octane boost, that type of thing. And fast forward to the future, we've got top tier fuels, and top tier fuels already have those additives in them, so you don't have to buy anything to put in your gas can, you know, uh, or, or in, with your fuel. So. Um, does everyone, Matt, you did the research on this, does everyone have a top-tier fuel, or is that select brands? Uh, select brands, and it's in the blog, which should be on KTR.com on Monday. But there's a website, toptierfuel.com, and that's got all, you know, Chevron, QT, uh, Shell, and it's just got the additives in there that help prevent the carbon buildup. And even though the carbon buildup, the, the preventers and the detergents are in there, it's still going to happen. But, you know, Acme Fuel or whatever, theirs don't have it. Costco, for example, they're not rated as a top tier fuel. And again, this is in my in my article, um, but they have five times the detergents, and they inject theirs right on site and, and, and blend it right on site. Um, and the only reason they're not rated as a top tier fuel is because they don't have those injection deals at all their stations nationwide quite yet. But uh, so that's good gas, good fuel, and uh, it's important. And occasionally, you know, if you want to use a Chevron product called Tecron or or an additive once in a while. I'm not a big believer in the additives. There's only two or three that I ever recommend. And uh, well, every time, every time I talk to the guys from ADS because they have a fuel injection test machine uh, uh, at their shop, and every time I, I leave from talking to them, I feel insignificant because they have better tools than I do. <laughs> but uh, uh, they're able to you know test and clean fuel injectors. Anyway, when we come back, we've got Jeff, Ren, Lance, Jim, and Oakley. And uh, we're taking your calls. This is Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and I cannot believe it because he's standing right next to me. Is Matt Allen. How did he get all the way from Westworld to here in just a matter of time? I guess I should be concerned if I'm going to race you in the autocross out of good guys with my Honda Element. Hey, remember I spanked you last time out of Bondurant, too. (laughs) I had the parking brake on. That's the only reason he won. (laughs) Yeah, there was no DPS on Southbound 51 right now. (laughs) Hey, we we don't have time to chit-chat. We've got a lot of calls here. So we're going to go with Oakley with a 1997 F-150. Go ahead, Oakley. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Go ahead, Oakley. All right, we're going to come back to Oakley, and we will try Jeff on a 2004 Chevrolet Blazer. Go ahead, Jeff. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Thanks. Actually, it's a 2004 Trailblazer, and uh, I, I've got this issue going where the oil gauge before was kind of going up and down all the time. Now it's just dropped all the way to the bottom. We ran the code meter on it a friend of mine has one and uh it came up it was a camshaft sensor and in fact a mechanic had told me that too so we replaced the camshaft sensor and uh, which is pretty easy because it was right up in the front on the top and uh still having the problems i went online checked around and some some places said uh you know try the oil uh the oil sensor something or other Anyway, so it's still doing the same problem. I replaced both of them and uh, can't seem to figure it out. So I guess the next question is, do I take them to a mechanic and let them try to figure it out, or is there something else I can try? I, you started out with an oil oil pressure question, it sounded like, and then we got over yeah. the camshaft. So I, I, I lost you. I disconnected there. So it, well, are, you, are you saying that the oil pressure gauge on the dash is reading zero, right? It is now. Oh, yeah, okay. it was... But what it was doing before was kind of bouncing around, not doing anything, or, you know, just kind of never staying in the same place. And it would say it had a little light on it that said uh, check gauges. You never got a low-end knock. And when I refer to a low-end knock, you know, it's a clattering that you get from the engine when there's low oil pressure. No, nothing like that. Um, once in a while, the, the – and, and I was told trailblazers kind of have, you know, have this effect that they do this when, the, when it's a camshaft sensor. So – when the gauge light, or when not, not the gauge light, but when also the check engine light came on, and we checked the sensor, or excuse me, we checked the gauge, and it came up that it was a camshaft sensor. Uh, I just, you know, I had a friend that said, "Yeah, you know, I've had one of these before. You replace that." And and it, so my wife would pull up to a stop sign or uh, up to a light or whatever, and sometimes it would just die. Okay, or, I think I think Matt looks like he's got something on his well, mind. There's here. there's a couple different things. I mean, you need to make sure you have good oil pressure by doing a manual pressure test the gauge very well may be bad but if that it could be the gauge or it could be the sensor 
But if that sensor is providing bad information to the computer, the computer's not going to adjust the engine properly because I'm pretty sure that Trailblazer engine has variable valve timing. And that, and, so, and that uses oil pressure to adjust that. And the computer may not let that happen if it doesn't think it has the right amount of oil mm. pressure. So we definitely have two, I think there's two distinctly different problems. And we need to first start by making sure that we have good oil pressure mechanically have good oil pressure. If the instrument cluster's not working, I don't believe that's going to affect the way the engine no. management system adjusts the valve or the variable valve timing. But that's why on the trailblazers and well, any car, the oil changes are just so critical because uh, there's so such small passages where they rely on that high pressure oil. And if they get carboned or coked up with, uh, sludged up with, with oil, they just don't work well. Well, since we got the guys uh, from Automotive Diagnostics, we were talking diagnostics in the first segment, and should I take it to a mechanic? Should I, should I go there? And believe it or not, you've already bought one camshaft sensor. You've already bought another camshaft sensor. And, you know, now we're, you know, what part do we put on there next? Absolutely. It needs to be diagnosed. I mean, we can, we can get lucky, you know, and, uh, and we can, but, but it needs to be diagnosed. There's no, it, it will save you money in the long run. And some projects are, you know, hey, that thing's real easy to change out. Maybe it's worth the gamble. Maybe it's a 20 or $30 part. And yeah, it's, it's fun to have a homeowner project and try it, but, but you got to know your limits and then stop. After right. you've spent 20 or 30 50 bucks, maybe, know your threshold going in and then bail out at the right time before you get in over your head. For sure. Well, let's go with, looks like, Jim and Gilbert on a 2009 uh, Toyota Camry. Go ahead, Jim. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, uh, thanks for taking the call. Uh, question on brakes. I usually do my own brakes. So this is the first time I've had front and rear disc brakes. And wondering, uh, do the front and rear pads need to be changed at the same time? And when turning the rotors, you need to turn the front. Well, how about switching the rotors from the rear to the front when, or like rotating tires and rotating rotors? Do they wear more on the front than the rear like the uh, old drum brakes used to? No, I, and I think that's a it's a great question. But I mean, really, the first bra- front brakes are going to be the brakes to wear out first. And typically, typically, you know, because the majority of your braking is in the front, so you're going to see those go away first. And you don't have to do them at the same time. In the old days, we would, you know, machine the front rotors and brakes for the first brake job, and it was always a clean and adjust on the rear brakes because in your old drum brakes, the pedal height came from the rear drum, uh, but there is no rotation of brake rotors. No, yeah, the front and rear parts, I'd say just about, I mean, on some, you might find a car where they're interchangeable front to rear, but no, that wouldn't be a normal, ordinary course of doing anything. So, yeah, they're, they're treated differently. You're going to in, replace the front based on wear, and you're going to replace the, the rear based on wear. You do need, need to machine the rotors. A lot of cars, you just replace the rotors. Um, they're not expensive at all in some cases, and, and some manufacturers don't want the machine, some of the Volvos and European cars. It's better just to use new ones. But uh, the other thing, on the rear brakes, on the calipers, you've got to be very careful. In a lot of the late model cars, they've got anti-lock brakes, stability control. There could be a lot of pressure waiting to be unleashed on those calipers, and if you're not careful, you could be put yourself in a real dangerous situation. Not to mention on the rear brakes, you've got to have the right tools to collapse the calipers because the parking brake is integrated. And, and uh, So I'd maybe do the front yourself, but I'd probably defer to a professional for the rears. Well, we've got Ben and Lance in Oakley. We're going to try and grab you here after the show. We don't have time to take your calls now, so hang on the line. And uh, diagnostic, I think, is a topic we ended up with today, is that properly diagnosing cars and accurate diagnosing uh, – is really become the game. It's a great topic since that's where you guys got your start is, hey, we're going to diagnose. That's the hard work. Actually, you know, unbolting bolts and bolting in new pieces, it's still, there's a level of quality that not everybody can accomplish as far as the actual workmanship, but the hard work is truly diagnosing the car and then being responsible for our diagnosis. So uh, in, uh, in auto repair, that's, that's the tough thing. And we sit around and talk about all the things we go through uh, to make sure we're on the right page. Well, and it's not always a one step. You know, we, I think as us, the te- technicians, shop owners, we get the blinders on. We see a code. I've got one in my shop right now, an Audi. You see a code, oh, it's a misfire. It's got to be just that. You do a quick test, and yeah, that's it. But then you fix that, and the next one shows up. So it's not always as simple as you might think. 
Well, glad we could be a part of your Saturday. We hope you're feeling way more car savvy. If you've got a relationship with a great shop, stick with them. To find a great shop like the guys from Automotive Diagnostics in Chandler, go to bumper to bumperradiocom There's a list of many great shops there. While you're there, be sure to like us on Facebook. Thanks, Peter, so much for putting on a great show and working the phones. I'm Dave Riccio, the automotive therapist. He is Matt Allen, the KTR car guy, and we'll see you next week from all the shops at Bumper to Bumper Radio.